Hello everyone! Welcome to the GEMS Podcast. I am so glad you all are here. Welcome everyone. Today we are so lucky to be joined by Dr. Jenny Briggs, who is a forest and fire scientist. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yes, of course. So to start off, do you just mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure, yeah. Um, I am in Colorado right now where I live with my family and it's freezing cold and snowy so I'm wearing a big scarf. <laughs> um, and I actually grew up in a cold and wet um, place, much wetter than Colorado. I grew up in England and moved to the U.S. for college. Um, so I've probably been in America for much longer than I um, was in England, but I still think kind of uh, of home in both places. And my, my parents and one of my sisters still live in England with a lot of my English relatives. Um, so I have here in Colorado with me um, my husband, Rich, um, two kids who are in middle school age range, and we adopted a really naughty puppy um, a few months ago, so we're trying to train him. And um, my job on the professional side is at a university in our town um, that focuses on STEM pretty much um, almost 100%. It's called the Colorado School of Mines, and it, I can talk more about that later. But um, I've been there just for a little while, like um, since the summer. And for most of the time before that, I was a fire scientist with the US Geological Survey, um, also here in Colorado in the Denver area. And that was a super fun and exciting job with lots of outdoor field work time and investigation. Um, but um, for various reasons, I was ready to transition a, a couple of years ago into working at universities um, and not doing quite so much of the field research. But I'll, I'd love to talk about both today because I'm still connected with all the fire and forest um, people and topics and I consider that my, my primary training. <laughs> I, absolutely and I, I got a puppy myself during quarantine <laughs> so I feel like people were just trying to get through without getting a, a, a puppy and I did not make it and it doesn't yeah. sound like you did either. <laughs> I know, and I, lo I love animals. That was what originally got me interested in science is just being fascinated by animals. But because my husband and I are actually both um, field scientists and have busy schedules, we felt like we were never home enough to reliably to take good care of a pet. And our kids are really, they love animals too, but they're just a little bit too young for us to be able to delegate everything to them. So when the quarantine began, my husband went out basically in the, maybe the second week and arrived home with a puppy and said, it's time. <laughs> but it, yeah, it's been like a mini experiment for sure. Well, I guess to um, expand a little bit on that, other than a love for animals, but is there an experience or a person who drew you into the field? Yeah, I was thinking about this and I realized that, um, probably the most influential person was my very earliest um, science teacher in England. And, and actually there, we didn't call it science originally when we were in elementary school, we called it nature. We did, did like nature studies. And I had this lovely teacher named Mrs. Garnet and she gave everyone in our class um, this little nature notebook um, that was blank with pages for drawings and pages lines and she said go into the countryside and you know observe animals in the wild and plants and um, sketch them and write down their behavior and their habitat and the time and and then come back and look up more information about those animals and plants and sort of develop like your skills as a naturalist and I think things in England start pretty early. So actually I have this little notebook here and it on the date on it shows that I was like seven years old when we, I got this notebook, but it's like all filled with little drawings of birds and hedgehogs and trees. And there's like some really, really old like leaves and heather like stuck in there that are falling out. But so that really, really sparked my interest when I was a little girl and 
I would kind of spend hours. I was obsessed with hedgehogs because they really are all over the place in England. They're so cute and they're so kind of like smart the way they curl up in a ball to escape danger. But that doesn't work very well for kind of human threats like cars or, you know, dogs. Like it works pretty well in foxes maybe. But, um, but kids were always encouraged to kind of rescue hedgehogs and pay attention to hedgehogs that were in trouble. <laughs> so um, that all those years with that nature teacher and that notebook kind of got me interested in ecology and animal behavior. And, um, and then I actually had a, a grandfather who, who was a scientist in America. My, my mom's dad was um, studied plants and photosynthesis in a big biochemistry lab in Berkeley um, at the university in California. So he was like very, very official and serious and uh, he represented like the other extreme. Um, <laughs> so, but he was certainly kind of a role model for us when we were little too. And so m when you decided to move away from hedgehogs and <laughs> you took a different direction, you know, what kind of got you into fires, well, forest fires and things yeah. like that? Yeah, well, a well, I was thinking that um, in England, there's this really big event, and it's actually right around this time in November every year. I mentioned to you, it's called um, Bonfire Night, the 5th of November. And it's this, well, it's kind of a long story that has nothing to do with science, but it's like this historic event um, celebrating the defeat of a villain named Guy Fawkes, who hundreds of years ago tried to blow up um, the British um, Houses of Parliament where the government um, works. And so it was kind of bloodthirsty. Guy Fawkes was actually burned in a fire as punishment for his crime of treason against the government. And so ever since then, for hundreds of years, all over England and Britain, people make these bonfires and they burn these sort of scarecrow type things and have fireworks. And I just loved this. It's not really a holiday. It's sort of like a celebration. But England is so wet and cold and damp, especially in November that, you know, I loved bonfire night because I was fascinated by the fires. And then um, when my family and I would go camping in the summers, that we spent in California, we would make campfires and roast, roast marshmallows. And again, that was something we couldn't do in England because everything was too wet. So maybe that kind of got my interest, um, but my parents sent me to college in California. And when I arrived in um, to start my freshman year, um, there were a lot of uh, wildfires in the, the hills um, near the college. And then when I started graduate school in Nevada, a few years later, there were more wildfires. And so I just was, it was just kind of around me and I was intrigued by it. It's just this huge, crazy force that sort of shapes the landscape in it. I originally studied how animals responded to fire. So I kind of kept that animal um, behavior curiosity strong, but then I sort of transitioned into looking more at fire itself and how it changes forests. And so I guess you kind of realized that in your undergraduate years and then later in your graduate years. So what was your doctoral research on? Oh, I had the coolest opportunity. <laughs> um, I got to, so my advice, the professor that I worked with in grad school, you, each student typically kind of chooses or is assigned to work with one advisor, as you, you might know. And so you have to kind of pick someone who's working on things that you're interested in, and then you sort of go deeper into that. And my advisor studied animals um, that uh, eat seeds, like um, chipmunks and mice and squirrels that live in the forest. They eat seeds and, then, and they also bury seeds and kind of spread them around in the forest. And they have, it, it would be kind of a cool, interesting behavior, but I was intrigued because it also results in helping the forest because the little animals can't go around um, and retrieve every single seed that they bury. Like sometimes they forget or might maybe they get killed by a predator or something happens or they just have buried like way more than they can ever go back to. 
So a lot of the buried seeds actually grow into little miniature seedlings and trees. And so the animals are kind of helping the forest next generation. And so my advisor kind of um, took me on as a student to help him study this. But because of all the wildfires, I kept bugging him and asking him like, what's gonna happen to, the, um, to all these you know, mini trees or the animals like in the big wildfires? And he wasn't really interested in that too much. He was like, I just, you know, he, he, <laughs> He had his research area in a place that the university owned in, a, in the forest, and it was kind of protected pretty well. And, and he said, you know, I'm just going to stick to my um, experiments here. But if you want to go like over the mountains and into the areas that are burning, you know, you can just like check it out and see if you can see like any signs that the animals are dying or maybe they're displaced or maybe the little trees are burning up or maybe the little trees are fine. So it kind of like gave me the green light to go and investigate, which I loved. And um, I found out that there was a group at Lake Tahoe in Nevada and California that were doing these um, prescribed burns, which I know, I think are done quite a lot in Georgia and in the South. Um, so there was this group like doing these small, er burning these small areas on purpose to try and protect um, a community um, that was basically surrounded by forest. And they thought if they burned ahead of a wildfire, then they could get rid of some of the fuels and it would actually be safer for the community. So in a sense, these, um, this fire crew was doing like an experiment that I could um, join in with. And I asked them, you know, could I study what's happening with the animals and the baby trees, like before and after you do the prescribed burns? And they said, yes, we'd really like somebody to like measure all that and tell us what's going on because the people that live up here are really curious and the more science um, we find out, the better. So I like tagged along with this big fire crew and I kind of learned how they operated and how their, um, burning system worked and I did this kind of before and after prescribed fire study for like four, four years and some other experiments too and that um, is what made up my PhD work. <laughs> That's super interesting and and I want to say I was reading something that you had done with like insects or yes, maybe yeah. particularly beetles, if yes. that's correct. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so do you mind telling us a little bit yeah. about them? Well, yeah, the, I guess there's a connection because, and I, I was thinking about it, I'm really interested in animals that affect their environment. You know, some animals like our dog, like he, well, he chews things, but he just kind of, <laughs> He doesn't have a sort of mission in life that has an impact on his habitat or his surroundings. So um, I guess I, I was really interested in these ma small mammals like the chipmunks because they did this um, seed caching that contributed to forest growth. But then um, I don't even remember, I don't think I was sort of recruited for my job in Colorado because of that. But Basically, there is a sort of a field within ecology that's called, um, that focuses on the study of plant animal interactions. And so in Colorado, I was hired to work on this um, weird phenomenon that was kill these um, bark beetles that are native um, had suddenly started a population explosion. There were millions and zillions of them killing big pine trees all throughout Colorado's forests and, and the Rocky Mountains in general. And um, nobody could really stop them from doing this. It's like a, a natural cycle that happens, but it was happening much faster and more trees were dying than had ever been recorded before. And so forest managers kind of wanted to know, like, is there anything we can do um, in an area before the beetles arrive, like they sort of move through the landscape, you know, season after season. And so the forest managers were like, well, what if we thinned out the forests? Would the beetles attack fewer trees then if there weren't as many trees to begin with and they were further apart? Or 
Um, does it not matter? Um, what if we do prescribe burns? Would the beetles be attracted to the fire and um, eat more of the semi-burned trees? Or would they like go away because they don't like burned trees or smoke? And so there were these kind of interesting questions that were relevant to the forest scientists and managers. And so again, I got sort of brought in as um, one of the ecologists who could help look at different like forest conditions and see what the beetle death was, you know, <laughs> depending on how the, the management um, had changed the forest before the beetles got there. And so that was really interesting. And as I say this, I realized that like one of my themes is just, I love jobs where I get paid to go hiking. <laughs> That is, that is super, uh, it's interesting because I think like the culprit that people would think of is, you know, it's the fires that are destroying yeah. it, but there's so many other variables and ways to figure right. out, you know, how to protect um, those regions. So that's super cool. Yeah. And, and I tend to think of fire as something that can have really positive effects as well as really negative Destru destruction effects. So, and also beetles, you know, I think people viewed them as the culprit or the enemy, like you said, but they never kill like 100% of trees. And one of my um, colleagues who's an entomologist and studies be these beetles specifically, he's like, they always are leaving stuff for their grandkids to eat. You know, they would never destroy a whole forest. So they'll kill off, if they, they um, their populations really flare up when the forests get really overcrowded and kind of drought stressed and there's a lot of weakened trees like all packed together and um, those conditions happen because partly we've gotten so good at putting fires out because we're scared you know we don't want fires to burn down communities so all of these cycles sort of go together and kind of feed off each other and and yeah like you said there's just a lot of variables it's really hard to sort of almost like disentangle sometimes and say, um, you know, I mean, the bottom line is we want people to be safe. We want to have some, as much natural habitat as we can, but things have gotten a little out of whack, you know, with respect to fires <laughs> and, and beetles and certain big forces that it's becoming hard to control. Absolutely. And, and I think touching on just like the interconnectedness. So I think any uh, woman that I've had the privilege to interview, they're like, this is what I do, but I also work with X, Y, and Z. And these are all of the people from different fields who have to, you know, we come together and accumulate all of this valuable research to come up with a solution. And I think wow. um, just the more I get to talk to all of you, it's, it just becomes more prevalent that that's a main theme. Like, everyone wow. it, it's a community it's not just i'm an ecologist and that's all i do it's everyone's together right yeah yeah i i completely agree i'm glad that that's coming out as a theme because i think um people often have a stereotype that scientists are all sort of these like weird solitary people in lab coats that just want everyone to stay away from them so they can discover stuff you know uninterrupted and there are some scientists like that and they sh there should be but there's a lot of others that sort of operate in a big team or a network like you said absolutely and and i um personally i'm, I'm a very social person and i think wow. when i got into science and i felt like you know i needed to pick one field and i you know wasn't gonna get to interact with as many people but it it's just not the case like it it is such a social network yeah. and i that is something i've learned as a senior that looking into you know what am i gonna do um it's been very helpful and knowing that my future career will not be um stuck in a lab by myself right right no and i think that's things are evolving and changing too. So um, I think there's been a lot of progress with getting away from that stereotype over time. So hopefully by the time you're in the workforce or looking for your dream job, it will be even easier to see lots of different models and pathways. 
Absolutely. And so, you know, what, what does your day-to-day operations look like, like as a, yeah. well, I guess as a fire scientist and then now? Right. I was kind of thinking about that there's two different, um, things. So I, in the fire, in the fire and kind of general field science realm, um, I would say that for me and a lot of colleagues, we, we had sort of these split personalities of during the field season, like really long days out in the woods in all weathers, um, trying to, you know, do, do surveys, experiments, measure stuff, stay out late. Um, Often we'd be in teams because it's, again, for field people, it's not super safe to be alone, even though I do love times where I, where I would just be kind of like scouting for new sites or checking things just like almost like a long hike. But usually for the field science, um, we'd work in teams and there was a, a lot of bonding and, you know, a lot of hard work and sweat and you know, <laughs> grit that was needed to get through days and weeks um, of the field season. And for my work with like mountain forests, there was always this like race against the snowfall every fall. And so we'd be trying to get in collecting all our data and finishing stuff up before we got locked out of sites by winter. Um, And then once we did, we were all pretty happy. Like as long as we had finished what we needed, the minimum of what we needed to get done was really, for me, usually kind of a nice cozy feeling kind of going into winter, but then we would sometimes be more solitary, like crunching our numbers and our data and trying to figure out what did it, what did the summer's findings tell us, Um, doing statistical analyses, trying to write up papers, making graphs and tables, going to conferences, that's another fun social thing. So if you would ask me like on a summer day, what the day would look like versus in the middle of January or February, it would be total different extremes, um, but kind of have this seasonal rhythm. And then, and I love working with students. I always did um, in my field jobs too, including I had high school interns and college undergrads and worked with grad students. And I love the energy and the kind of, um inspiration that younger scientists bring because they just don't have as many i don't know rules in their heads from the you know senior you know official professor types so i would really enjoy um my work with students and that's kind of what led me into my university job that i have now and i mostly work with grads grad students um so they're pretty they're getting pretty serious about their own research and I'm sort of a general advisor and guide. And they, at my university, people could come and meet with me because they're also doing a field study and they're like running out of, you know, energy or um, they, you know, need some help problem solving something. Um, or they're like in a lab engineering. It's, it's a big engineering university that I'm at. Um, and Uh, or there's like brilliant mathematicians and physicists and I can't really help them with any of their technical stuff, but I'm helping them prepare, you know, for the different milestones in their graduate program. Um, So yeah, I've kind of become more of a generalist and I'm learning a lot. So my day to day is, I don't know, meetings, phone calls, reviewing people's um, papers and theses, trying to help the university improve the way it, um, it supports grad students. Um, and uh, like, let's see, this past weekend or Halloween weekend, we had a big sort of pizza Halloween extravaganza contest that I helped to organize. And that was just something totally fun. <laughs> and, and so um, as I guess in the education realm, the pandemic has definitely impacted your work. Um, so how has it impacted you in Colorado? Because I bet it's a little bit different than here or yeah. you know, the people that you work with and like the forest scientist, um, has it impacted them? Yeah, that great question. I and mean, we've had a really crazy 
a month in October of fires in Colorado, you might have read about some of them in places that I used to work a lot, like Rocky Mountain National Park. So I think, you know, some of my colleagues have had to just, you know, ignore or like incorporate COVID restrictions as best they can, but like just focus on safety in terms of fire. Um, that has been a whole challenge in and of itself. Um, but I think a lot of field work had to go on hold um, in general, like leaving fires aside. My, my husband's um, an earthquake geologist and he hasn't been able to do any field work for his job for six months. And um, so one thing that's been happening is people have been finishing a lot of the write-ups and these statistical analyses of their data. Like I said, it's like that winter kind of data crunching season just like extended through the year. And I've, I have a friend in Georgia actually who's um, an ecologist and he contacted me a couple of weeks ago and he's like, ta-da, the paper that we were working on, I, I've managed to finish it because I've been stuck at home. And so now we can send it to a scientific journal. and. Um, so a, a bunch of that kind of work has been happening that's sort of positive. Um, and then at my university, the students, we've been joking that engineering students are really good at just following lots of guidelines and protocols and safety measures. So our university has had very, very low um, COVID cases. It's still operating. Um, I'd say people are less in person, maybe two thirds of classes are in person with low enrollment or spaced out students. Um, but the students are being really responsible. Everyone has to wear a mask 100% of the time. And a lot of things seem to have been moving ahead, you know, regardless of the difficult conditions. So I'm really proud of our campus. Um, and um, I hope that everybody, that things will continue to stay kind of stable and improve. Absolutely agree. Yes. Um, I, as a student, you know, we have a virtual or in-person option mm -hmm. um, in Georgia. And so I'm currently virtual, but as a senior, you know, you want to go in person and oh. have that experience. And, and so I hope that things improve and continue to improve just so everyone can um, find some new sense of normalcy. Right, right. Yes. Oh, I hope so too, especially for all seniors like you. <laughs> Absolutely. And and so in, in your work, um, kind of, you know, the mission of GEMS uh, is there is this gap between male and females and mm -hmm. we're trying our best to uh, close that gap. And so have you seen um, a difference between the number of men and women that you work with? Yeah, I, I think in biology and ecology, the numbers have been much more even over the last maybe 10 years than they were when I started out. But um, in forestry and fire, fire, the world of fire, it's definitely a majority of men still and fewer women, although the women that are in those fields are really um, I don't know, really, I guess I would say there's kind of some bonding that happens between the women that are in those male dominated fields. On the other hand, I've felt that people, both men and women try not to make sort of a big deal about it. But I did find when I had my kids, either I was pregnant or just after I'd had the babies, um, I found that people, men in in those in my professional life, were did ask me these odd questions that they never asked my husband. Like they would ask me constantly, like, "Well, who's with your children right now?" And I'd say, "They're at daycare, you know, with professional teachers." Or, you know, sometimes my mom would come to stay, or sometimes my husband would have the babies with him, and I'd say to my husband, "Like, does anyone ever?" when you're chatting about your kids, does anyone ask you like, well, who's taking care of them? And he's like, no, of course, nobody's ever asked a male scientist that question. So I think there's a little bit of a, um, I wouldn't, sometimes I would interpret this as sort of like a guilt trip, um, like, 
but maybe that wasn't how it was intended. It was just um, sort of this question that somehow women might get more after they become moms than their husbands or partners after they become dads. Um, but I think it's specifically with, with fire and forestry, I would really encourage all girls and women who might consider those fields not to let it put them off that they might be outnumbered because I really believe in this sort of strange like psychological way that those fields need more women because I think there's often a very um, um, stereotypical male perspective, especially about fire, like, like we need to get the biggest machines and tools and resources to put it out, um, <laughs> like battle it head to head. And I've worked alongside some men and I'd be like, could we just like back off and stay safe and, you know, maybe be more proactive between fires, but not sort of view this as like a, a fight and a conflict. And I know I'm generalizing and stereotyping, but I think the more diverse ways of thinking about um, challenges, uh, the better uh, for solving them. Um, and I did a lot of fire training with mostly all guys and it could get very competitive and macho and but I just don't know if that's the most effective approach so if any um girls and women are thinking you know I might be interested in that career path but I'm kind of intimidated or I feel like there's a lot of stereotypes I would say girls and women can absolutely do all the necessary work and they might bring a cool perspective um, that the guys might not have considered. Um, and one final thought on that is I, the fi firefighters have to do a pack test every year. And if you want to have a fire a red card to be fire line safe um, as a scientist or like some sort of person who's, you know, associated with a fire crew or fire program, which I was, um, I would always have to do this pack test as well. And you, um, you'd probably enjoy it because it's like, I know you're a, a runner, but you have to have, wear a heavy 45 pound pack and get um, cover three miles in less than 45 minutes. Um, so you have to go like a pretty good 15 minute hiking pace with this huge 45 pound pack. So sometimes for women, that's like a higher proportion of their body weight than for men. But um, when I did the pack test the first time, I was with a couple of women and a, like dozens of guys, but the women were all um, outdoors and athletes or moms. And I was used to carrying my kids on my back and my one kid. So I was just fine during this test. And a lot of the guys were kind of like gym rat stereotypes and they were not enjoying this hard workout with this huge pack. So to my surprise, there and to their surprise like the three women finished ahead of most of the men so I was like, we were like just walking along chatting at a fast pace so um there was something like i had heard all this mystique about oh you have to pass this crazy physical test and it's really hard and and so my girlfriends and i were like well that was that was no problem at all <laughs> that's so, awesome no that's that's great so <clears throat> kind of going off of like wanting to see that female perspective. Um, I ask everyone this. It's kind of a off base question, but it's a fun question. If you had the opportunity <clears throat> to sit down with one woman in STEM who's alive or not, who would that woman be? Well, I think you gave me a preview of this question and I'm so, well, okay. First answer would be, I don't know this woman, or it, this is a hypothetical woman, but I would really love to, if there is, if I know there are female fire chiefs who, you know, run a whole fire station or program, or maybe in like an agency, like the Forest Service, that deals a lot with fire management. I would love to talk with the highest level woman in that type of role, because I would love to hear how she has navigated some of these, you know, ups and downs, or maybe being told that she wouldn't pass the 
pack test or that she wouldn't be able to make a tough decision on, you know, fire safety or putting out a fire or starting a prescribed fire. So I'd love to have lunch with anyone who's, who's um, sort of taken their pathway to those high levels and as a woman. Um, but I can't resist saying that one of my childhood female scientist heroes is Jane Goodall, um, the primatologist from England. And I got to have lunch with her um, about a year ago for, in real life um, through a weird connection through some friends. And she is amazing and she's really funny. Um, and she's dealt with a lot of, I would say, rude male comments or perspectives about her abilities in the field um, when she was a young woman. Um, and she shared some of those with me and the other people at this lunch. And she's 86, I think, and she just was cracking us up with her stories. So <laughs> I was really privileged to be able to actually meet one of my heroines. That's amazing. No, that's so cool. Um, I would say, uh, for me, yeah. Who would you pick? Oh, <laughs> I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> um, I, that's such a good question. I never get asked back. Um, uh -huh. I guess um, when I was in seventh grade, I guess going based off of um, the UK, I did a really long project on Rosalind Franklin. Oh. Um, so I think she's just super interesting and in what she contributed to science and what she had to go through and the obstacle she's faced with Watson and Crick, you know, I, yeah. I think that she is very, very interesting. Um, but I really don't know. I am, like you said, I'm really lucky to have the opportunity to talk to a lot of the, if the amb ambassadors, because oh. I think after, you know, whether it's 30, 45, an hour, um, I, I gain new role models. <laughs> I really do. I, I get to learn so much and I've um, had the privilege to see so many different sides of science and stories. And I'm, I think I would do follow-up lunches. If I could do it in person, I would, I would want to follow up lunches with all of you. So. Um, oh, that's a, thank you. <laughs> Likewise. Um, but I think my last question, um, as we come to a close, is there any advice that you would give for girls looking to pursue STEM or mm. a career like yours? Yeah, great question. Um, well, one advice, one one big thing, we a couple big things we already touched on, which is the science does thrive with people with people skills who are sociable and build teams and networks and connections um so um if if anyone feels that that that's you know those are their superpowers then don't let anyone kind of tell you that oh you're too much of a people person you shouldn't go into science because science needs people people for sure um even and and it's progressing in that arena <laughs> Um, and then I would say, um, and I, I feel having a daughter and, and being a woman, I would, I would say that women maybe tend more to be socialized to kind of look for teams and connections and um, operate sort of with, with their friends or their make, build connections and relationships maybe more read, readily. Um, and I don't know if it's innate gender. I've been kind of like studying my son and daughter. They're just, but there's just one of each of them. So it's not a very good experiment. <laughs> but, um, but I would encourage like boys to become more team oriented if they're not and, you know, girls to like own their team building skills that they have. Um, and then I also got told a lot that my grades in math um, weren't very impressive. And I, I, Again, this is another maybe girl stereotype that for whatever reason, maybe more girls identify themselves as weak in math or not interested in math than boys. And I was certainly in that group, but I kept telling myself, um, it won't matter too much for ecology 
I just have to learn how to deal with statistics. Or as I found out when I got there, um, once I got through graduate school and I could always consult professors and st statisticians um, for help, but once I kind of got through like learning the basics of statistics, I could really um, collaborate with others who were strong in statistics and math. So um, even though my math grades were pretty much always terrible, I just tried to keep forging ahead <laughs> regardless and not let it get me down or be a reason to like drop out of science or, or, or biology. And I really have not needed like advanced, you know, calculus or anything um, super heavy duty in the math world. Um, in my work. So that would be another sort of lesson from my life is just sort of um, try and like if you keep having that spark, like I want to continue in this field, even if some of my grades or some of my prerequisites aren't clicking perfectly, um, if you still have that drive and spark for the eventual field um, or role, um, I wouldn't let those. Um, grades along the way drag you down. <laughs> um, that's, that's great. <laughs> oh, and then the other thing really quick, sorry, I know none, none of my answers have been very concise here, but um, <laughs> they're good questions. Um, so I would also say I'm a huge fan if people are thinking about different careers or pathways or like wondering, do ecologists have to do a lot of math or do, do fire scientists, you know, do you feel really outnumbered in fire as a girl or a woman? Try to find opportunities to, to volunteer or interview people or like tag along as an observer or do an internship. I would say sort of test things out as much as you can when you're in high school or college because um, it's almost like never too early um, to, to start like trying and in investigating. I don't know if you've done anything um, like that yourself and how it's worked. Um, but one of my neighbors is a high, she just started college and as a high schooler, she was an intern with me and she really enjoyed forest and fire work. But she told me that her first idea was um, being a vet and she worked at a vet practice just like to generally help out for a few afternoons um, every summer or season. And she said she didn't love seeing animals in pain or sick. And she hadn't, it kind of hadn't dawned on her until she did that, that that was the majority of what the vets would deal with. So, um, so she, so I really commended her for like, she did was in some program in her high school where they got to sample different um, careers through internships and I think she's like way ahead of where I was at least um, <laughs> at that stage because she's done that testing. No, I, I think um, every single woman that I've talked to, that's, you know, <laughs> internships, they really harp on that note. Um, so I know that that is something that girls and gyms are starting to look into. I, I think right now it's really difficult with um, the pandemic, it yeah. kind of impacted, you know, those opportunities aren't really prevalent right now. Um, but interviews, you know, over video and things like that, those are available. So just learning to kind of adapt to this, um, this experience right now. Right. And I mean, sometimes something smaller scale than an internship can work like, like, asking people if they have a side project that, that you could help with or like a volunteer. And yeah, it's, for, especially for the field sciences, it's really hard to just not be able to get out. But um, like I said, sometimes people are just working through piles of data that they collected in an experiment. And they might like to have someone um, assist with certain, you know, sometimes these things can be like a lot of busy work and not super cool as, you know, hour by hour, but just being around the people um, that are offering that, you know, little, you know, small project or whatever, sometimes that gives good insights or, um, you know, can be kind of a nice um, way to get to know somebody. And then when something more 
interesting or bigger or hands-on opens up down the road, they might might think of um, that you know assistant or volunteer. Um, so, yeah, it is a tough it's a tough time, but I hope people can be creative and uh, you know um, use the silver lining part of some of the time. Yes, and I think getting the chance to work on the statistical analysis side of it, it's, <laughs> it's still introdu introducing you to an aspect of, if that's what you decide to do, this is still a part of it. So I think um, there's always value in learning things like that. So yeah, yeah. Absolutely. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I thank you so much for your time and your knowledge sure. and um, your contribution to science. It, it's been such a nice hour to talk to you. Thank you so much. Likewise, I, I, I think this is a brilliant idea and group and I'm thrilled that you're doing what you're doing and I can't wait for you all to connect and inspire other girls um, who knows all over um, through the podcast. So thank you for including me. Absolutely. Thank you all for listening. If you have any questions or comments, you can contact us through Instagram, Twitter, Facebook at Colga Gems. You can also reach us through email. Our email is colgagems at gmail.com. That is C-O-L-G-A-G-E-M-S. And I'll see y'all next time. <laughs>